Association, we would like to welcome you to the 2020 Town Hall, How to Build Resiliency During Difficult Times. My name is Scott Bastian and I am the Director of Student Support Services with Englewood Unified School District. My co-moderator for the evening is Bryce Flewellen, who is the Englewood Active Communities Lead and Community Impact Director with the American Heart Association. As we open up this town hall, I would first like to take a minute to provide instructions for our participants to be able to fully enjoy this meeting and to participate, to participate as desired. Throughout the program, you will be on mute, so we encourage you to use the chat box to engage with speakers and other attendees. Carol and Elena, who are with the American Heart Association, will respond to questions posted in the chat. We encourage you to change your settings to show your comments and questions to all panelists and attendees by clicking on the drop down. You also have the option to listen to today's program in Spanish or English. Just by clicking on the interpretation button on the bottom of your screen and clicking Spanish. For those of you who want to listen in English, no action is needed. Closed captioning is only available in English. Buenas tardes a todos. A largo del programa, sus micrófonos estarán silenciados durante la llamada, pero les animamos a que hagan preguntas y comentarios a los panelistas en el chat o la caja de chatear. Nos encargamos de traducir las preguntas al inglés para que contesten los panelistas. Le recomendamos que cambie su configuración en la caja de chatear para mostrar sus comentarios y preguntas a todos a los panelistas y asistentes haciendo clic en el menú que está al lado en, el, en la caja de chatear. Usted tiene la opción de escuchar esta llamada en inglés o español. Para español, oprima el botón de inter, in, interpretation, interpretación en la parte baja de su pantalla y escoja español. Muchas gracias por asistir a la conversación. You're on mute, Dr. Bast. You're on mute. I apologize. Thank no you. No problem. Before we begin, I'd like to share the American Heart Association's stance on recent world events, focusing on social injustice and civil unrest with a video from the CEO of American Heart Association, Nancy Brown. Like you, I am heartbroken by the tragedies that have taken place across our country. The memories of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and far too many others remain with us, and our hearts go out to everyone, everywhere, who is grieving and searching for justice. The American Heart Association denounces senseless acts of racial violence against individuals and unnecessary violence in our communities. As a nonprofit healthcare organization, we are taking a stand on social justice issues because it's the right thing to do and because there is scientific evidence supporting the link between social justice and health equity. Racial disparities in heart disease stroke, and other chronic conditions exist and are well documented. African Americans are also more likely to be uninsured. There is also scientific evidence that African Americans' physical and mental health is negatively impacted by the inequities that exist. Add this to the fact that in the midst of a global pandemic and given barriers to health that exist, African Americans and other people of color are disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. The American Heart Association has championed health equity for all people for nearly a century, and we are more determined than ever to eliminate racial and class disparities. We will redouble our commitment to overcoming barriers to health and to addressing social inequalities. We must stand together as a relentless force for a world of longer, healthier lives. That is our mission, our contribution to a more equitable society. People are counting on us like never before. We will listen. We will drive change. We will be relentless. Thank you for your support and thank you for listening.
thank you, American Heart Association, for sharing such a relevant and impactful video from CEO Nancy Brown. Now it's time for us to get started with our amazing panel. It is an extreme honor to introduce our first panelist. He has dedicated his life to educating and encouraging at Promise Youth to make healthy life decisions and providing training and resources to service professionals to address the needs of communities impacted by the effects of complex trauma. Mr. K. Ron Valentine has worked professionally with incarcerated youth and has delivered numerous workshops on trauma-informed instruction and care across the county, state, and country. He has authored the Live Above the Hype Hip Hop Life Skills Curriculum, the Urban Youth Culture Competency and Engagement Training System, and his latest book, Beyond the Crack Generation, Surviving a Trauma-Organized Culture. Welcome, K-Ron. Thank you, thank you for having me. Mr. K-Ron, can you please give our participants a brief one-minute summary of your area of focus? Um, what I focus on a lot is just really about how psychological and emotional trauma affects behavior and affects uh, cultural norms and things of that nature and ways to create, a, you know, just a safer environment so people can heal. Thank you, Kron. Now I'll ask you a couple questions to which we ask for responses to be no more than three or four minutes. Here's the first question. Regarding community trauma, Please explain how the recent COVID-19 related restrictions compounded by the effects of systemic racism on communities of color may further impact the mental health and well-being of children and parents. Okay. Um, what I'll say about that is when we talk about trauma, and I'll keep it brief, when we talk about trauma, one of the biggest um, ways to, to heal from that we know is developing safe relationships, right? And with what's going on right now with all the isolation and things of that nature, it can, it can definitely lead to, to more emotional challenges, um, adapting to a new normal that's still being created, you know, all the uncertainty that parents and students, or, you know, children are having, you know, all of these things can, can, can compound, you know, and, and lead to just more uncertainty, right? Um, the, 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 emphasis on the brutality that's going on right now. You know, all of these things lead to fear and anxiety and things of that nature. But one thing I do want to say, I just had a conversation about it. We know that, you know, um, we talk about responses to trauma that the, the general responses are, was it fight, flight, or freeze? And right now we're seeing, and appeasement is another one, by the way, but then we're seeing all over the world that people are in fight mode. And sometimes we misinterpret that as, as being negative, but we don't understand that sometimes it's the fight mode that causes healing. You know, I may have been in an appeasement for so long. I may have been in, in, in you know, the flee uh, mechanism for so long that I finally got, you know, find my power to fight. And that is a part of the healing process. So it's, it's, a, it's irony in all of this. Thank you for that. And definitely we are in a new normal that is not normal compared to what we are used to. Our next question, what are some examples of self-care strategies and how can we better equip parents to be able to practice these strategies with their children? Okay, with that one, the first thing, anytime anybody asks me about self-care, I always have to first uh, distinguish that there is a difference between self-care and self-indulgence, right? And I remember when, uh, when we first went into quarantine, I'm a, I, I'll be the first to admit, I, I indulged, you know what I'm saying? I'm still trying to work off some of this indulgence. But self-care, when we're talking about self-care, we understand that self-care has a lot to do with healthy practices, you know, things of that nature. I'm not saying self-indulgence is bad, but I'm just saying there is a difference. So when we're talking about our, our children and things of that nature, one thing I would say is creating safe spaces for our children to share and discuss and unpack a lot of this stuff. You know, I, I remember one one gentleman I know, you know, was acting out, just really just cutting up. And the first response to, for the parent is discipline, right? Generally, you know, you act a certain way, you get discipline. But when they pull back and start to ask this young man, like, what's really going on with you? All kinds of stuff comes out. So sometimes, you know, right now we want to be a little more sensitive to behaviors and, and really give give these young people the safe space to, to be able to unpack some of this stuff because they're processing in a way, you know. Um, something else that I would say is as much as we can because it feels so unsafe and, you know, with so much uncertainty, create new normals 
or new routines, you know, routines as much as we can in the home, you know, because right now, you know, we used to getting up, go to school, go to, you know, there was a routine, whether they like, you know, it was funny that my, my kids start complaining that they couldn't go to school, you know, I'm like, oh, now, now this is what you got, because they want that routine. So, you know, trying to create routines, walking with, with our kids as much as if we can walk, playing cards, whatever you do, you know, these type of things I would say is very important. Like, um, and, and just, and just again, giving these kids a, a, and student and parents, you know, when I would leave it at this parents create being intentional about creating time for yourself. I don't care if that means 15 minutes locking yourself in the bathroom. You know what I mean? If you got to say, look, my stomach hurt and I'm going to be in here for a minute, whatever you got to tell, but creating certain spaces for your, for you, for you, because you know, everybody's the home dynamics is not the same. And it was like, for, to be totally transparent for some of us, that time away, you know, you going to school, you going to work, we, we needed that. Now it's like, I got to see you all day, every day. You know what I'm saying? So creating those, those times, being real and creating those times to just for yourself, you know what I mean? And I'll keep it at that. Yes, definitely. All right, thank you very much, K-Ron. All right, K-Ron, Actually, would you like to touch a little bit more on uh, complex trauma? As I know, that's one of your, your passionate areas as well. Yeah, well, well, when we're talking about complex trauma, the challenge with that is we're talking about trauma compounded upon trauma. It happens simultaneously, right? And the best way I like to share this is when we talk about many of the communities that we work in with, particularly gang and drug impacted communities, and now we're putting on you know, the COVID piece, and then, you know, racism is being brought to the forefront, so it's right in our face. Um, it's kind of like when, for those who are familiar with post-traumatic um, stress disorder, PTSD. And, but what I, what I do when I do uh, the comparisons, and I like to acknowledge the fact that, and no disrespect to anybody who's experienced PTSD, but unlike PTSD, complex trauma is not post. So while they're dealing with one form of trauma, we have this other traumatic experience that's happening and this other traumatic experience. And a lot of times there's not any safe spaces or healthy spaces to process this. So what starts to happen is we start to find maladaptive coping mechanisms, whether it be self-medicating, whether it be anger, whatever it may be. So that complex trauma is very real and it's being compounded as we speak right now. So we want to acknowledge that. I thank you for asking that. Acknowledge that and, and, and be very intentional about finding ways to heal. Thank you, Karen. We appreciate your wisdom and your experience and your passion for the topic. And we're Thank very you. grateful for your participation. Please stick around. Don't go anywhere because we need you for the Q&A later in the town hall meeting. Okay, right on. I'll be here. Thank you. Our next panelist has spent several years as an educator, coach, and administrator for public, nonprofit, and independent educational institutions throughout the California area. Amber Gravely, is a diversity, equity, and inclusion practitioner and the director of SOS, Student Opportunities for Success, facilitating presentations on cultural competency, motivation, and social emotional learning strategies. Thank you very much for joining us, Amber. Can you please give our participants a brief summary of your area of focus? Absolutely. Um, so as you, as you shared, Social emotional learning is really um, critical and just touching on what Kiron said, and acknowledging trauma, acknowledging all the different um, things that students bring to the table, right? And trying to provide access and opportunity. So specifically, one um, tool that I help to teach parents and students is to use self-regulation strategies. And essentially what that means is when we are in fight or flight as Kiron was ex expressing, how do we understand that? How do we become embodied to know that? And then how do we have tools to help us move through those emotions and use those emotions not as a barrier, but to actually motivate us in our learning process? Thank you. So now here's your first question. Given that the current social and academic climate is nothing like our students have ever experienced, let alone any of us, what are some self-regulation strategies that could help our children cope with emotional and academic demands? Thank you for that question. Um, I think I have two acronyms that I think will help. Um, the first one for emotions is to be. So what I mean by that is we need to breathe 
and we need to express emotion. So I'd love us to just jump into a practice of this. Mindfulness is one thing that's been extremely helpful personally, and we find that with young people it helps and parents. So I, I just wanna ask, and we can think this to ourselves, um, what emotions are we feeling right now? Are we stressed? Are we anxious? Are we angry? Are we sad? Are we overwhelmed? Those are all real and understandable emotions to have, especially given the nature of everything happening today and the compound uh, uh, complex uh, trauma as, as Kiran was expressing. So I'm gonna just invite us to breathe quickly. And some of us may have never done this. Some of this, this is a practice that we, we normally have. So I'll just ask you to inhale, take this time to just be and exhale. And then inhale, can we be aware of what we are feeling and exhale? Can we inhale, just be as you are, no judgment and no apology and exhale. Inhale, be assured that we know what we're doing and we're doing it the best we can. And exhale, one more time, inhale, and be confident that we can endure and be resilient. Exhale. So that just was one example of how to be. Um, and in expressing emotions, I think being honest, being honest with the children that are in your lives, whether you're an educator virtually or parents, you know, I'm feeling this today. How are you feeling? Those questions, those open-ended questions Kiran mentioned earlier, um, really doing the check-in and maybe not having anything to change or shift, but just that awareness can help us move through our emotions. And then the other acronym that I'd like to share um, is learning. We wanna help our students learn how to help themselves. So in learning and motivation, um, generally we're not asking parents to be teachers as much as they have to be, right? What we want is to support the learning process, the learning and motivation process, right? So that's the L. We wanna help learn and motivate, and they are reciprocal. One depends on the other. If we feel motivated, we can learn better. If we're, we wanna learn and we learn something, we can be motivated to learn something more. So really checking in on what's relevant to your, your, your children, your young people, being aware of the environment they're in now, and finding things to relate to. Literally our brain, if we know something in our learning environment, so if the students aren't in their classroom, but in their home, oh, I know how to cook this. Oh, that's adding. So using something relevant and building on that, what we call schema in the world of psychology, building on that, that is a learning experience. Every moment is a learning experience. And so just being mindful that we can empower ourselves to have that ability to help students learn and be motivated. Um, encouraging effort and affirmation are similar around the emotions, but effort, uh, there's something called growth mindset. Some of you may have heard of it. It's research from Carol Dweck. And essentially it says, we want to inspire growth mindsets versus fixed. So being a growth, having a growth mindset, if you're sitting with your child and you're asking them to do some work and they just say, I can't do this, I can't do math. That might trigger yourself to think, gosh, I can't, <laughs> I'm pretty bad at math too, right? <laughs> so being honest with that experience, I felt challenged, right? But you can't do this yet. If you just add that yet, that's an example of showing effort and the failing or the mistakes, that is all in the process of learning. And just affirm that the effort is being made. Um, and those are really great strategies. And lastly, um, reminders and negotiation. So young people, especially really, really young people, they need a lot of reminders. So in the classroom, sometimes we have the advantage of having bells and you, know, you have systems and okay, this is our agenda for the day. But if we're at home, maybe we could start at night. Say, remember in the morning, at eight o'clock, we're gonna start on our summer reading, right? So it's the summer, summer, summer in summer school, some, we, need to, we need to keep some routine, right? To keep them learning. So we're gonna do some reading tomorrow in the morning. And then in the morning when you wake them up, remember, we're gonna start at eight o'clock, right? Another reminder for little ones, gosh, I see you just finished your cereal, fantastic. In five minutes, we're gonna meet at the table and start reading. And then 30 seconds in, if they're already started, that's a really great opportunity to affirm, wow, I see the clock doesn't even, hasn't even hit eight and you're already starting to read, the book is cracked open. So those are some strategies um, and I have more, but I don't wanna take up, uh, take up the time, but these are little strategies, little ways 
um, to help support students in their learning and even negotiating in the sense of they're, they're upset, you know, they're tired, they don't wanna learn, there's a lot going on in the world. You know, that's okay. You may be saying, if you just start for five minutes, I get it, I'm tired, I'm exhausted. This is emotionally draining. Can we just try five minutes at this and see how it goes? And then chunk up the time because especially little ones, we think they can sit like we can because we need to do our work. They really probably can't sit for more than 20 minutes. It's not something wrong with them or their behavior. We learn that focus, we tell the little ones, focus is a muscle we need to build. So, and even by high school or, or our, as adults, 15 minutes is really the biggest chunk of time we should really be trying to ask to do any kind of work or effort and then take a break. It's a reward, it's a reminder, you can reinforce. We did a good job. We'll sit back down and get at it a little later on. Thank you, Amber. In regards to the uh, those those practices, it sounds to me like um, you would encourage like routine and maybe schedules for, for for children. How how what role would you recommend for parents to play in trying to uh, normalize such a routine in, their, in with their students or with their children, our yeah. students? Absolutely. Um, I think Kayron mentioned it before. You, you're mentioning it. routine is really, really critical, and different environments may have a different routine. I think as a parent, you can also uh, acknowledge feelings. I may be working from home now, or I may not be working at all, and this is different for me, but let's see what we can agree on doing today. Um, I think those reminders help with that routine and the schedule. Um, I think with techn technology, if we have smartphones, we can set reminders on our phones and that's really helpful. We can have calendars and planners on our phones or we can have hard, uh, I have a calendar up on my wall, I have a planner, you know, that's just helping and, and asking what works good for you. You know, especially as a student, maybe it gets to nine, 10, 12. What did you do at school? What can we do here that's similar to follow our schedule? And a lot of times they know they wanna share with you. You know, we just have to open up the dialogue and absolutely schedules, reminders, and routine are critical. Thank you very much, Amber, for participating. Uh, as I stated before, uh, please stick around for the Q&A later. Uh, we'll have some great questions coming in from our participants. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to introduce and pass the baton to my co-moderator, Mr. Bryce Flewellen. Hey, thanks, uh, Dr. Bastian, and thanks, Amber and Kron. I mean, I'm learning a lot already, so I'm, you know, I'm a little selfish. That's why I wanted to have you guys on this panel, also. So I, I'm taking notes over here. I need to build my uh, focus muscle, just like the kids. So I'm, I'm reminded of that. Uh, so this next, this next panelist, I'm going to brag on him a little bit because he's he's a humble guy. So I'm going to brag on you, Lawrence, before we get into the conversation. Um, because people don't understand how multidimensional, if they don't know you, they don't understand how multidimensional this guy is. I mean, first of all, he's a selfless, uh, dedicated community advocate. And well, now let me back up a little bit. He, I, he grew up and lives in Inglewood, went to Inglewood Unified. So he is one of Inglewood's finest. So, I mean, I know if we were um, in front of an audience, people would be clapping and yelling. Because, you know, you're you're providing, you're coming back, you're a true testament of coming back to the community and providing uh, the information uh, of what you've learned and, and just being an overall asset. But um, he is a scholar. Um, he studied philosophy. He's a former professional athlete. He is an entrepreneur. Let me tell you, this guy had product in Whole Foods. He also makes some of the most delicious ice cream. Um, he's a humble, he's a husband, he's a father. I mean, I don't know if anybody knows Gordon Parks, but if you haven't heard of Gordon Parks, he's like the Gordon Parks of, of 2020. So if you don't know him, you need to look him up. And so Lawrence, I know you you don't brag on yourself. And, and he's a former uh, USC alumnus um, and, NFL alum, and NFL alumnus as well, like I said previously. And so I just wanted to take time to, to brag on you. I've, I've been blessed to know you now for about five years. And um, like I said, it's been a true blessing to me. And, and what you poured into my life. So I wanted to start there. Um, so you can give yourself a hand. Like I said, <laughs> I know you humble, you give humility a bad name, but at any rate, before we get, when we get into this conversation, man, I really appreciate you being vulnerable and being on this, on this call because um, this is your ministry as well. 
Can you talk to us a little bit about um, how you first figured out that you were suffering from depression? Yeah, it was, um, <clears throat> you know, I experienced disappointment before at various points in my life uh, from having set goals and not accomplishing the goals at the pace that I want to. Um, and so once I knew that the disappointment that I was feeling was altering my life, and I wasn't hanging out with my friends. I didn't want to see my family. I didn't want to answer the phone. You know, I didn't want to do anything that I seemingly loved doing before, right? I stopped cooking. Uh, I stopped like combing my hair. I stopped caring about what clothes I wore. Um, and every day just felt like Groundhog Day over and over and over again, where there was just this tape, this loop, constantly going in my head, reinforcing this narrative that wasn't true. And so and once I realized that this wasn't disappointment, but that it was something greater, and you know, my mom started noticing, I started gaining weight, different things like that. Um, you know, and I was fortunate to have a partner at the time who was a mental health uh, specialist as well in terms of being a social worker. And so she's the first person who really told me, you know, that I'm struggling, you know, with different things, right? And, you know, she lived with me, she saw it, I was able to hide it from my family and my friends, but she's like, hey, you're going through some serious stuff and you need to look at, at this or whatever. And I thought that it was that disappointment, but with that framing and understanding that my life was no longer what it was, and that I was a shell, of who I was. I, <clears throat> I realized then that I needed to take action, but it was a little bit longer after that before I realized I needed to get help. Thank you for sharing that. I mean, what a blessing to have somebody just ironically who was your partner who was, um, you know, into mental health and being able to encourage you to move in that direction. I know um, I have family members, my mother suffered from mental health issues. And one of the things that we talk about um, is that people of color, particularly black and, and, and brown folks, there's there seems to be traditionally a stigma on getting help or going to therapy. And I, and I reflect on that be, because I feel like what k -Ron was saying earlier, with all the trauma that we've been dealing with or we have dealt with, we should be the first people that would feel worthy enough to be, seek therapy and be able to self-care and take care of ourselves. And so I want, I want you to share like how you were able to overcome with the with the audience and, and some of the tools and resources that you you've been able to use because I think that's extremely helpful for folks to really know that it's a process and it's a journey. Right, right. And thank you for the question. <clears throat> I think it first starts with uh, being honest with family and friends. Uh, a lot of people don't understand that depression, suicidal ideation, or mental health isn't who you personally are. It's something that you're going through at the moment, right? A lot of mental health is caused by underlying issues, uh, undue amounts of stress that are unmanaged, that cascade over time, uh, perpetual disappointment, the framing of you know incidents in your life and how you see things. And I think that once you realize that you are not, your mind, right? Your mind and who you are are two separate things. Mm -hmm. And mind is totally okay with having this runaway conversation of thought throughout the day. I mean, we have millions of thoughts. And so, you know, meditation, journaling, hanging out with friends, uh, counseling, all of these things help iron out the thoughts. And the trouble comes when we are embarrassed to ask for help or embarrassed to tell people I'm hurting, right? For me, you know, at the time I'm coming out of the NFL, I have millions of dollars, um, supposedly achieved everything that I had dreamed of, right? And so to be able to open up and tell somebody, hey, I'm thinking about killing myself because I'm happy, right? The common thing is, our answer was, bruh, you got everything you want. Like, what do you, and I had to explain to people that it's not about material 
accumulation that leads to happiness. And uh, the first thing I had to do was separate myself from money. The idea that money is uh, equates to happiness, right? And to have come from a situation where I made millions of dollars and to want to kill myself when I had millions of dollars, it didn't make sense to me, right? Like here I am, I wanted this money, did everything I could to get here, and now I'm unhappy, right? And so I'm winding from this attachment to fulfillment from buying things, right? Not identifying with, oh, I have this, uh, or I'm able to buy this, right? I felt good on being able to take my uh, sense of not fullness out on purchasing things that I felt would make me full, right? And with that, you start to understand that life is, <clears throat> it's two things. It's your situation and your reaction to the situation, mm. right? Between the situation and the reaction, biologically, there's always room for choice, right? And so the key thing is understanding that when you're depressed or you're going through suicidal ideation or just mental health agony and angst and pain, you have to understand that you have a choice not to necessarily feel better, right? There are steps that you have to take. So it's not, I'm going to feel better tomorrow, right? You have to treat it as if it's a room just full of stuff that you have to organize and pull out. And that's what the journey, uh, the journaling is about. You have to confront within yourself these things that are making you feel this way, right? For me, I had a lot of unanswered questions about some of the things that I didn't do with sport, mm -hmm. right? And that the gap between my reality and my vision, uh, they say that that's always the, the space for disappointment where you want and where what you have, right? And so in retirement, I realized that I had something that was less than what I wanted. And I blamed myself for that, right? And so as I worked out of it, I was able to see that circumstances and decisions are made when you make them from the best place that you're at. So never go back and judge something from where you are now. Right. Mm. I can never go back and judge what I did in the NFL from how I feel now. Right. At that time, there was a different set of circumstances that led to decisions that I made. Right. Whether it's a life relationships or anything like that. And so taking a chance to look at those and really not blaming other people. Right. Mm. I, you know, I didn't get what I wanted. And yeah, I was involved in a situation where politics played a role. But ultimately, I didn't do my part, right? There were things that I could have done that I didn't do. And so not blaming other people, although they had a role in it, right? I didn't take, and I wasn't taking uh, accountability of everything that I could do, right? And so the first step is understanding that if you're not happy about certain things, whether it's the amount of money that you have, whether it's the amount of friends that you have, whether the job that you have, the first thing you have to think about is how you are investing your time. It all comes back down to time, right? We all have the same amount of time. We all know the benefits of reading. We all know the benefits of eating healthy. All of these things come together to create this view and this experience we have with life. And so if you are feeling a certain way and in feeling that way, you don't dive into resources that make you feel better or cause you to grow, that tape continues to play. I spent, you know, I went to the mental hospital about five months after I got married. And, you know, we had to spend the first six months of the year, uh, not at our home, but at, at my mother-in-law's house, just so I can recover. And part of that, you know, I was on medication. They had me on Kalanapin, which is the world's like most addictive drug and strongest, you know, and so it was something that, you know, put me in a, a lethargic state. But within right. that, I had to find time to, you know, tap into my faith, right? Maybe I didn't have the ability to sit and watch a whole hour sermon, but I can watch 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. I can't read the whole book, but I can read one sentence. Getting something positive, even if it's a little bit, is better than not getting anything positive. And so 
just like Amber was talking about, you know, negotiating. You have to negotiate with yourself with improvement. You can't look at the end result and say, hey, I want to be Arnold Schwarzenegger and I just decided to lift weights, right? You have to be willing to eat, work out, drink, sleep, you know, train, all of those things to get there. And many a times people don't have the awareness of the process to achieve a certain goal. So they think they've done everything that they can do when they haven't. And then they go back into themselves and they blame themselves instead of saying, okay, a no means that I can improve on something or this isn't right. Maybe I can look for improvement here. And with that, it falls into that growth mindset on being able to look at circumstances as challenges to be overcome as opposed to roadblocks meant to stop you. These things challenge us and they bring us to who we are and provide our ability to testify to other people as to what we've overcome. But for myself, if I don't talk about, you know, the feeling of being in a mental hospital twice, having, you know, multiple times been very close to killing myself and having to understand I'm not hurting myself, I'm hurting everybody else. Mm -hmm. I'm out of the pain. Mm -hmm. But now everybody else is in pain forever. So, you know, it was selfish and irrational, but that's what mental health does to you. It makes you selfish and irrational, and it forces you to isolate and cut off from the help because of that embarrassment. Right. Everybody's dealing with something, and that's why we need to be kind, because just because you are hosting this as a co-moderator, it doesn't mean that you're not going through stuff in your life and that you right. get off right. of it and you're not happy. Right. Yeah. So we can't look at people and say, oh, they're happy. Their life is great. No, look, I had millions of dollars. Everybody would think that my life was great, but I was thinking about killing myself. And so, no, live you know, oh, I'm sorry, Lawrence. No, that you, was it. Live your life. You, you're sharing so much powerful, um, so many powerful things. I tried to kick, take notes and keep up, but there's so many nuggets. And, and one of the things you know, that you said that just, 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 uh, just now you talked about material wealth doesn't equate to, to, to happiness. And I think that's powerful because so many particular people who are struggling or living in situations that are not ideal, we often think, you know, I did growing up, Hey, if I had this, that would make it better. Um, and, and then that's not the case. And so I mean, we could get into deep, but I want to make sure we allow allow enough time for the other panelists. I want to I want to just say thank you for sharing your testimony because I, I think I know for myself I learned a lot, and I've known you for a few years, and and so I know that um it's been impactful for the panelists, and lastly, particularly um, for those who are from Inglewood, um, we got I mean we're so proud of you, and I'm not from Inglewood, and I'm proud of you, so I know Inglewood is is ecstatic um, to see what you've been able to come through and, and what you do in the heart that you have for, for others. So I really appreciate you coming on tonight. Thank you. Um, true. And we'll have, we'll probably, we'll probably have a ton of questions to get to that people want to ask. Um, next, I'm going to send it back over to Dr. Bastian because we have a, a, another pr a professor that is going to provide us with some great insight around technology and, and the use of technology with our young people and um, even in our old people too, because technology <laughs> is addictive for us. So I don't <laughs> All ages. Yep. So I'll pass it over to uh, Dr. Bash. Th thank you, Bryce and, and, and uh, Mr. Jackson. Thank you as well. I don't know if you saw the chats, but it's, it's, you've, you've touched a lot of people and, and I have a feeling you've spoken for some people who don't know how to speak up about their similar, you know, trials and experiences. So thank you both. Our next panelist is an associate dean and professor of psychology in the College of Natural and Social Sciences at Cal State University, Long Beach. I'm sorry, Long, Los, Los Angeles. Los Angeles. <laughs> he is also the associate director of the Children's Digital Media Center and chair of the Social Policy Subcommittee of SRCD's Asian Caucus. In addition to numerous impactful studies, Dr. Kaveri Subramaniam is currently researching the relation between technology use, school belonging, and academic performance among first-generation college students. And in 2013, Dr. Kaveri was a recipient of the Cal State LA's Outstanding Professor Award. Dr. Kaveri, thank you very much for being a part of this important panel. 
And we'd like for you to give our participants a brief summary of your area of focus before we start this. Thank you so much uh, for having me today. I also want to say that I was very moved by uh, the previous speaker, Lawrence Jackson, in particular what he said about you know, the gap between vision and reality. And I think that's so important uh, in all aspects of our life, including when it comes to technology. So I found that very insightful. Uh, with regard to what I do, I study the role of technology in the life of children, youth, and families. Uh, in addition to, I've been studying it for a long time since when I was pregnant with my daughter and she's now 30 with her own child. So I've been studying it since the old Mac. Uh, but what I really feel uh, passionate about is trying to simplify that research and sharing it with parents, educators, and anybody who works with children, because I know it's a very confusing world, world out there, very overwhelming for parents in particular, and uh, I wanted to try and help, help them navigate the space uh, with some comfort and ease. Thank you, thank you. Um, I'm assuming you were learning on the Apple II or Apple II Plus? Yeah, I, my first study was on Marble Madness. Some gamers here may remember that was an old game. <laughs> right, I have that experience as well. Right. So, so we'll go into the first question, Dr. Kaveri. Sure. Given the transitions to remote learning or what some mm -hmm. call distance learning, what do you think are some possible areas of concern with regards to our children's well-being? Sure, that's a great question. And can I have the slide, please? So, so I want to talk about two different aspects of digital learning and just really technology these days really impacts all aspects of, of youth well-being as well as across the lifespan. But what we are finding in this new normal is truly, you know, it's just we've never been through it, right? It's we're all at home trying to do our best, studying, learning, living, sleeping, and there was a time when I think all of us just loved our devices, but I think everybody I speak to cannot wait to get back to work and have those real physical interactions. So as you can imagine, uh, digital learning just is impacting us in many different ways. And I just wanna to speak to a few key areas of, of what I think we should be aware of. First of all, I do wanna talk a little bit about the direct physical effects. Uh, I know that there's a, a few of the panelists subsequently are going to talk about the, the, the impact of physical activity. And I think that's a real concern given how sedentary, how, 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 how much we have not, we're just sitting at our desks with our devices. So they will speak about that. But what I wanna speak about is the real physical consequences of, of staring at a screen, hunching over our devices, texting constantly, or even you know playing video games, anything, right? Everything is happening through the screen. So we do have to be mindful. Anything, any repetitive physical activity has consequences, whether it's pitching baseball, right? You can get repetitive stress injuries. If you're typing and sitting a certain way, you're going to get injuries. So we have to be mindful about how uh, we set up our spaces. And it is difficult. Uh, when my son was visiting a few weeks ago, I was using his bedroom as my study. And then when he came, I got kicked out and I converted my study to be in the dining area. So we are all trying to make do and doing the best we can, but we do have to worry about how we set up these devices. It's best not to be hunched with your neck bent because you can get what's called tech or text neck. Uh, so you do have to be mindful about that. Um, the best way a lot of the other speakers have talked about routines, it's important to take a break. Uh, frequently take those stretching breaks, stretch, change your posture. Uh, and move around. So that is really important from a physical perspective of just spending, you know, all our time learning with these devices. The other area that I really want to talk about is sleep. So as, as technology, you know, it started with the TV in the bedroom, then the video games in the bedroom, then it became the cell phones. Now you have the smart devices. You, you're going to bed with this little computer that is so powerful. And one of the things that stands out in all of our work with adolescents is that many of them go to sleep with the phone next to them under their pillow. And when you ask them, you know, why do you do this? It's their alarm clock. So 
the, the challenge is when you go with the phone, you're, you're surfing the web, you're watching cat videos, you're texting your friends, you can just spend enormous amounts of time. And we know that, that media in the bedroom, cell phones in bed really delays bedtime. It re leads to reduce, it's associated with reduced sleep, later waking in the mornings, daytime sleepiness. When I go visit high schools with my son, I would see these kids sitting outside just with their head on their desk, fast asleep at eight o'clock, you know, uh, zero period and, and, and first period are just challenging sometimes. So I think parents, we, all of us, including adults, I think I find when I take the laptop, sorry, my iPad to bed, it takes me longer to go to sleep versus when I sit with the book. So we do have to worry about that playing video games late at night. It can disrupt sleep. Uh, so we have to be mindful about how we use technology in our bedroom uh, and just in general, uh, because it, it can disrupt sleep routines. Then getting to the question with regard to digital learning. So I, I want to be, I want to tell everybody to give ourselves a break, right? Have some grace, uh, manage our expectations, manage expectations for your children and manage expectations for your children's teachers. This was very difficult to just go remote in a week, two weeks uh, and provide instruction from home. I mean, just two weeks ago, my laptop died and it was quite difficult to figure out everything. And even today I'm, I'm using my iPad as my microphone. So it, it's challenging. So, so give yourself a break. But I think the main thing to be mindful is we're using the same screens to do everything, whether it's reading for pleasure, uh, social media, as well as studying. And I think it's important to recognize that when you're reading for school, you have to read differently than when you're reading social media, right? You don't just skim when you're, when you're reading your history textbook. You have to do deep reading. You have to take notes. You have to have a book next to you. So you have to use different strategies and different techniques when you're using the screen for digital learning. Uh, you also have to try and mimic your routines that you had in school. So the first few days when I started working from home was quite challenging. And then I realized I had to do the same thing, get up, shower, get dressed, formal clothes, maybe not as formal, put on makeup, uh, eat my breakfast, set aside some food for lunch and take those breaks. Children are no different. We have to do the same thing, set up a schedule for them, uh, give them a nutrition break, give them a lunch break, have some food packed for them in the fridge or have them pack their own lunches in, in the refrigerator. And you know, try and mimic those eight hours during the day because that's when the teachers are probably online available to do answer their questions. There's no point if your child is going to answer their do their homework at 1 a.m. So these are just some strategies off the top uh, uh, that, that I think can really help to maximize the digital learning experience. But first and foremost, I would say manage expectations and you know, set routines. Thank you very much. I know you spoke a lot about um, you know managing and limiting our use right. of, of technology um, as well as you know just how we're using it i mean even while right. this i found myself you know feeling the aches in my neck and, and, and <laughs> right uh, my nine-year-old daughter uh reminds me to pick my phone up and put it up higher at, at, at exactly at, head level instead. at high level if i don't grow horns on the back of my neck <laughs> so um yeah, so she's aware but um you know and i think uh we always have to be mindful of that for ourselves as as parents as well but um in terms of utilizing technology um are there other ways that parents can actually um rely on technology more um to enhance the overall well-being of their children and and themselves sure uh can i get the next slide please thank you so Oh, so, okay, there was one more, but that's okay. I think, you know, the main thing that I like to remind parents is that, and everybody, myself, adults, is that technology is a tool, right? And so it presents both risks as well as opportunities. And whether you, you, you have to worry about the risks or whether you can benefit from the opportunities really depends upon, you know, how you use it. What do you do? How long do you do it? And who do you do it with? Are you interacting with your peers? Are you setting up you know, game dates where you're playing video games with people that you already know? Or are you spending all your time interacting with people that you never meet 
that are offline. So these are some important questions. And then the other thing that's also important is that it really does depend upon the individual user. And this is where I always tell parents, you know your child best. You've been seeing them from when they were a baby. You know, you, you know. sometimes you do have to listen to your gut, gut reaction and every child is different. Uh, you may need to set limits with one child, but maybe the other one is, is able to self-regulate better as Amber said. So there are individual differences. And so for some, so it's a one size rule, unfortunately doesn't really fit all. You do, it does really depend upon what you do, how long you do it, and who you do it with. Uh, in terms of using technology, well, I, I really like this site, which is called commonsensemedia.org. They have a lot of resources. Uh, it's very age appropriate. They help you select good movies, good games. Uh, it also has resources in Spanish. Uh, it also has a page for coronavirus support. It helps parents navigate this. This is difficult for parents who are also working at home uh, or parents who have to go, who are considered essential workers and are out there and have to go through the daily stress of being out in the public. So this site uh, has a lot of good recommendations uh, in terms of selecting media content. Uh, but again, the, my, the main thing that I say is when you do anything too much, whether it's running all the time, right, when you're eating junk food all the time, anything too much is, is not going to work. It's the same with technology. Moderation is important and content does matter and also who you do it with matters. And as a parent, if, if your child is spending a lot of time online, doing things or interacting with people that has no resemblance to their interests or the reality of their offline life, then, then it's really, it is important to set, step in and set limits. But even beyond that, from the beginning, have open communication, have open lines of communication and in, have that trust so you can have good conversations about what they're doing online and who they're interacting with online. Thank you so much for your insight and, and uh, that, that presentation, Dr. Kaveri. Uh, so, and we will be uh, uh, sh sharing this information, commonsensemedia.org, and uh, look forward to learning more from your, your research and studies as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So at this time, I'd like to go ahead and pass this back to Bryce um, as he introduces our next panelists who are, with the, uh, who, are, who are both professors in kinesiology. Bryce? Yeah, yeah, thank you. And thank you, Professor Kavari. Um, I'm using my phone to help me work out. So you'll be happy to hear that. <laughs> That's, That's it. Good. Now, That's good. <laughs> um, these two next panelists, uh, Dr. Uh, Ann Larson and Dr. Sierra C Cordova. I've only known them for a few months, but it seems like it's been uh, years. We are kindred <laughs> spirits in our love for um, physical activity. I was blessed to have parents that started me um, in sports at around five. My mother started me swimming. And so she planted that seed and and I, and I appreciate that, her and my father. Um, Dr. Larson is the um, director of kinesiology at Cal State LA, and her peer, um, Dr. Sierra Cordova, is associate director of kinesiology. Um, and so thank you for joining us today. Um, you'll be glad to hear that I worked out at 6.30 this morning, so. Excellent. Oh, wow. <laughs> I am paying attention to it. It has helped me get through COVID and everything else. That's right. So um, whoever wants to answer, can you tell, tell folks why um, or how movement, you know, helps manage with stress and just mental, mental health overall? Like, I think a lot of folks, um, and I'm speaking for myself for years, a lot of people really, you know, understand or, you know, kind of have an understanding of what it does physically as far as like, you know, losing weight, helping manage things like diabetes and heart disease. But I don't think there's been enough attention um, given to how it helps impact your overall mood. So I'd like to get into that first. Sure, sure. I'm going to take that. And um, I want to first say how glad Dr. Ann Larson and I are to be here yeah. with you tonight and how eager we are to talk with you about the very powerful role that physical activity and exercise and movement has on really both our mental health and emotional well-being. And science has been very crystal clear in providing that 
or rather proving that exercise is like a medicine. And it's one of the most versatile and natural treatments that you can give yourself. And the very best part is that when you and your kids find something that you like to do, that you like actually like to do, and that you look forward to doing, it's fun. And it's it's not meant to feel like a punishment, which sometimes exercise is perceived as. And on that same note, physical activity doesn't have to look like running marathons or bodybuilding, although those are fantastic, but it can look like dancing in the living room or jumping on a trampoline or even playing games with the kids inside or out in the yard. You know, any of these activities that make your heart beat faster, that get you sweating, and that you can do for at least 30 minutes, those are perfect. Um, so having said that, the two points that I really wanna highlight are the ways that physical activity helps both adults and kids to, number one, think better, and number two, feel better. So in starting with some of those ways that moving helps you to think better, doing physical activity helps the way that your mind understands and processes information that goes into it. So first of all, it helps us to remember things better. We, we are so busy and so distracted every day, almost at every moment, there's always something that makes us forget things. But regular exercise can help you to remember things better. And not only that, but it helps us to concentrate. So same thing here, we're living in super high stress constantly, and it can be really difficult to concentrate when you need to. And if you've ever felt like foggy, or fatigued, or sometimes I say that I feel mentally drained. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, exercise will help you to focus in on your thoughts a little better and pay better attention. And not only that, but exercise can also help us to solve problems and make clearer decisions. And that's really because when you're thinking more clearly and you can concentrate and you can focus, and you can pay better attention, then you can think and find strong solutions to issues that come up in your life better. And, you know, it's funny, I always tell the kids that I work with that exercise makes you smarter. And sometimes they don't believe me, but it, it, it really, really does. So I, mean, I need to be exercising uh, right now. Th yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> And, and in addition to helping us think more clearly, it also moving, it also makes us to feel better as well. So it literally helps us to manage the negative emotions that we feel by releasing these feel good chemicals in our brain when we do physical activity. And ultimately it makes us feel more happy. And the release of those chemicals that I'm talking about, it helps us with things like improving our mood, helping us to sleep better, reducing our stresses, reducing our anxieties. It gives us more energy and even helps us long-term with feeling less depressed. And besides releasing those feel-good chemicals in your brain, it can also help us cope with negativity in a healthy way by serving as like a positive distraction, getting away from cycles of negative thoughts, or even having that good physical activity experience with like your own family, your close friends, your kids together. So exercise is really one of the most helpful medicines for our mental and emotional well-being. And I think most importantly here that physical activity helps families to bounce back from challenges together. So mm -hmm. if you think about it like this, when, when we're able to problem solve better and we have good energy, we've slept, we have mm -hmm. better confidence, we have less anxiety, mm -hmm. just as some of these benefits of exercise, ultimately families together, they mm -hmm. have a better capacity to recover from difficulties. Mm -hmm. So yeah. yes. That's with that, powerful. I'm gonna pass I mean, it over I mean, to Dr. When I, when I, Lars. He's gonna talk a little bit more. Yeah, what I wanted to say too, when you you talked about um, helping with mental health and and thinking about what Lawrence talked about, and uh, when my, my mother was uh, suffered from bipolar disorder, and one of her mm -hmm. um, 
one of the resources and tools that they gave her was to increase her um, movement and exercise. Mm -hmm. So yes. it's a tool around, like you said, enhancing your behavior, um, your mental state. Um, and so I always remember that. And that's something, everything you just said, it, it helps me be the um, reason why I do it early in the morning to gain clarity um, going into my day. Mm -hmm. um, so with that said, I know mm -hmm. Dr. Larson, if you want to jump in on this, we, sure. with COVID, COVID came along. It and did. so now a lot of our families and our kids, especially, um, you know, are in the house more. And as, yep. as Professor Kavari talked about with technology. Yep. So how do we how do we create that balance or or make right. it where it's fun that and things people can do in their house to make sure they're staying, they keep they keep moving? Well, that is a great question. And before I answer it, everyone right now, stand up. Wherever right. you Thank are, you, you must oh, no. stand up. You Thank knew you. someone was going to ask you to move around <laughs> a little bit. Come on now. There we go. Stretch yeah. a little bit. All right. Now, you can, all right. All right. now you can that. sit down. Now you, sit, now you can sit down. And, uh, and back, back to listen. If you could go to the uh, next slide, please. Ah, there we go. So, oh my goodness, so many challenges with COVID, nothing is open, there is no access to anything. What in the world should we do? A couple things that we know, number one, um, any exercise is better than no exercise. Sierra alluded to it. Exercise does not mean running the New York or the LA Marathon. Exercise is moving our bodies for 20 minutes. If you can do 20 minutes, that's great. The latest research shows that even in chunks of 10 minutes, there is a health-related benefit. So any exercise is better than no exercise. The second thing, sometimes people say, well, what's the best exercise? The best exercise is whatever exercise we're going to do. <laughs> so yeah. I am happy to go out and do a number of, of, of different things. I am, and I know many people are happy to go out and do a number of different things. Others, it's, it, it, it's a little bit uh, more limited. That is fine. The best exercise is the exercise that you are going to do. And if you chunk it in 10 minute increments, that is fine. So I want to talk about something that's kind of fun, and I've, I've done this before with, with kids and families in, in, a, in a variety of different um, contexts, but something that's fun to do is, is what I call the personal challenge showcase. And that is, and as our panelists have said in, in, in our COVID time, setting, uh, establishing routines, gosh, mm. is so important. So something that you can do as a family, and this means all caregivers, parents, you all are doing this as well, but you, you set up a schedule where you do what, what I call fit bests, sport bests, and speed bests. And those are different activities that pertain to general levels of fitness. Those are fit bests. Those are things like push-ups, sit-ups, and planks. Sport bests relate to sport skills, so things like throwing or kicking to a target. And speed bests, oops, I forgot to include examples, but that is, is different things you do where you time yourself, like, like going out to run a 100-yard dash. Right, we don't have access to tracks. That is fine. So in a safe space, go outside and run from one end of the block to the other. I know in working with kids, the minute you pull a stopwatch out, oh my gosh, yeah. they are on that line. And even some of our ones who say, I don't like this, I hate this, I'm not going to do it. They are on that line and they will never admit it, but they want to know their time and they want a chance to do it again. So you can set up a schedule and, and, and here's what I'm gonna ask. We have 64 people on, on our webcast. I am gonna ask all 64 of you to set up a schedule where you rotate one day you do a fit best, the next day you do a sport best, the next day you do a speed best, right? And then you cycle through those. And you can choose, say, three fit bests to cycle among three different sport bests, three different speed bests, and set up that schedule. 
And then, so you go through that, that you, you go through that sequence and then you do the sequence again. And guess what? The next time you do push-ups, yep, even Sierra is gonna do more push-ups. Even Bryce is gonna do more push-ups. So, and you can set these things up at home. So, okay, well, I don't have, um, I don't have a ball. I don't have access to a hoop. Um, growing up, uh, I had to figure things out that were mm. uh, home equipment. Mm. You, I made a tape ball out. Of, I made a ball out of tape. Uh, I made a ball out of an old sock and electrical tape. And there, that was my ball. And I threw it at a target. Ball. The whole sock ball. That's right. I threw it at a target. And um, to the point, yes, as as Kaveri point, I'm, I'm sure I had some overuse injury back then. <laughs> but these are things that that can be done in 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 the home. So that's my challenge to all. Uh oh, we lost somebody. So someone didn't like the challenge. <laughs> but to all 64 of us, we are going to establish a schedule where every day we are doing either a fit best, a sport best, or a speed best. So the other yeah, thing I, I want to talk about oh, real quick is that uh, something that we know about uh, participating in physical activity, and that can include sport, exercise, kind of whatever, whatever we want to call it, right? We don't need to get all complicated and, and call it a particular thing. But, but something now that we know um, through research is, is that physical ac activity lends itself to building resilience. Mm -hmm. and, and there are a couple of reasons why. Number one, this is a very, very basic definition of, of resilience, that if you have a sense of hope, a sense of autonomy, and you have some relatively established social skills, that for the most part is, is lending to a, an overall resilient sentiment, right? So something in, in regard to how physical activity can help with, with hope, there, there are the do-overs and, and related to like doing a, a speed best event where we're saying to kids, okay, go, we're going to, I'm going to time you from, from this pole to this pole and let's see what your time is. Oh, okay. That was pretty good. Well, can you do better? Yeah, 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 yeah. So the sense of, of, of the opportunity to do do-overs, that's a huge part of, of what helps physical activity develop resilience. Autonomy, man, if we can instill in, in our young people the autonomy of, I am an athlete. I am a baseball player. I am a shortstop. Then we know that that is a protective mindset. Um, mm -hmm. Finally, social skills, all those rules, part of the game. We don't like the safety rule, the NFL and all of that. But, but the fact that the, 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 the sports and games that we play are bound by rules that in and of itself helps our kids learn social skills. Yeah. I am sure I've taken up too much time. So I'll. No, I mean, that, that's all, that was all, that's all powerful. I mean, yeah. what you said about um, building resiliency, my, my, my sister two years ago had a major accident and fell on her neck where she should have been paralyzed. But what she told me after she recovered is she said, you know, I thought about all the years that I played volleyball and sports. Yeah. And I was like, I can overcome this. And so she's she's actually walking, doing everything normally when yeah, most of the people in the hospital said she probably shouldn't have been walking at all. She should have been paralyzed oh my. from the neck down. Wow. So she said I she said I just I just, you know, thought about my background in sports and yeah. said, I've been, I've been work, I've been through worse pain and I can overcome this. <laughs> and then another thing that you both said, but another thing, Dr. Larson, that you were talking about, I was um, on another panel and a trainer was saying, uh, put together your BMW, like your bare minimum workout. She was like, right. people love BMWs. They can remember that. <laughs> so go right. to what's your bare minimum workout? Hey, I'm going to do 10 push ups today and 10 sit ups and 25 jumping jacks and you build up every day That's and every right. week. Like sometimes we over, you know, we think about the goal like Lawrence talked about it, and then that gets us frustrated because we know we may not be able to get yep. there. So, I so we know that that, oh, that, oh, that that makes me think of one more thing and I promise I'll be yeah, quick, no but, but, but as, as far as establishing habits, right? 
sometimes we get, we, 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 if, if we're interested in starting an, an exercise program, all of a sudden we, we have ourselves programmed seven days a week, two hours a day. Well, you know what? <laughs> let's let's set tiny habits. It's called tiny habits. Tiny habits and this so is like some that. of the latest research on habit building. We're going to set tiny ha- and and then every time we reach what our whatever our goal is, we're going to give ourselves an affirmation. Um, mm-hmm. So starting an exercise habit could be something like putting your shoes out. And if you put your shoes out, you say to yourself, yeah, me. Now that is a very tiny habit, but it's through tiny habits that we get to the place where we say, oh, I am ready to run that LA marathon. That's true. Yeah, that's true. I want to, I want to thank both of you. Um, um, I know I'll be working out tomorrow and and thank you for sharing. And and I know that um, our young people and our parents appreciate all that information as well. We're going to go into um, last but not least, our last panelist um, is uh, Chef Julie Ward, an accomplished plant-based chef. Um, I've known her for a couple of years. She is extremely committed and passionate about nutrition, particularly in our our communities of color. Um, She is a disruptor and a visionary. She does online classes um, now during COVID, but before she did all these amazing uh, plant-based classes really teaching people about the, the, the correlation between what you eat um, and how it impacts your body. And so, but tonight she's gonna share a little bit about you know, what you eat and how it can impact your, your mental and physical, mental and physical health. Um, welcome Chef Julie. Thank you, can you guys hear me? Yes, we hear you. Perfect. Also just one correction on my slide. It's uh, my name is J-U-L-I-E. So anybody who is you know, trying to reach me, it's Julie instead of Julia, but I am so happy to be here uh, today. And so um, I also wanna say, you know, Lawrence, thank you for your story. I myself suffered from depression as a kid. So I totally understand, you know, that reality. For me, it was, I just thought life was gonna be like this forever. And there was nothing different Mm. um, until I got a lot older. And like you said, realized that being depressed was just a constant thought for me about just focusing on myself. And so once I came out of that, I began to look at some other things that were going on around me, plus very faith-based. So what kind of kept me on the planet was the fact that I knew that if I did take off, you know, I'd really put a dagger in my mother's heart, right? Mm. So that and then it becomes a trickle effect, which she still be here. And yeah. so through my life and my living in my 20s, I decided to look at my food. Um, mm-hmm. Because one of the things that I realized growing up from Chicago was that whenever I would eat certain things, I would either be extremely constipated and therefore depressed and really not in a good mood for days. So um, I did change my diet right when I got out of college and then began to study food and take a look at you know, what's really causing some of these problems. Um, And so, you know, the traditional thought process about depression has always been that, um, has always been that it's in the brain and it's a serotonin deficiency. And while, you know, that's a traditional and some of that is very true, and that's due to an enzyme called uh, monoamine oxidase, also known as MAO. So MAO mm-hmm. is eating up too much serotonin and it's taking out the balance of the serotonin and the dopamine. So then there's a there's drugs for that. But now the re, you know the new information, the new science is coming out that serotonin is also 95% of it is created in the gut. So when you're talking about what you're eating and how it's affecting your mood, um, you begin to look at okay, so what can I eat to increase that serotonin production and how does it go? And there is something called the brain. It's the vagus nerve and it's the brain gut access. So what we eat goes directly to our brain through a ton of nerve cells. And so as I began to study this and was like, oh my God, it's really about my food. Um, I, I began to look into um, foods that, so there's, there's three ways to do that. One is fiber. So we are talking about how do I feel better? How do I feel happier? Um, what can I do to start increasing my serotonin and it would be fiber more fiber and that can be 
fibrous vegetables and they don't have to be crazy expensive, but foods high in fiber can help you um, increase your serotonin. And the way that happens is it goes through your digestive system. It turns on cells that are precursor to serotonin, serotonin and produces more serotonin. So that's one way. Um, another way is to eat foods that are high in MAO. So MA, that will inhibit the MAO. So, um, and those would be things like berries and apples and the um, World Journal of Psychiatry came out and they did a study on foods that would actually, they have what's called an antidepressant scale. So when they take a look at foods that have all the vitamins and minerals that actually um, will keep you from being depressed and depressed, being, de being depressed. And you know, the ones on this list are watercress. These are my green leafies, watercress, mm. spinach, mustards, um, lettuce. And so, you know, fresh herbs, there's a ton of spices that you can also eat like cloves and oregano, um, saffron. That's one of my favorite. If, if you've ever, if you guys are making quinoa or rice, put saffron in it. You will yeah. just the smell of it and the aroma around the house just makes you feel great. But what I thought was really interesting in terms of my research from uh, the World Journal of Psychiatry was also uh, the Centers for Disease Control also did a study on foods that are nutrient dense. And so there's mm. an extreme parallel between foods that are nutrient dense and foods that are very high on the antidepressant food scale, meaning watercress is number one. So watercress has a ton of nutrients and also it's very high on the antidepressant food scale. So if you can get, there's one thing I say, eat more watercress and it's this itty bitty little, little leaf, but eat more of it, put it in your salads, put it in your smoothies, get more leafy greens. Um, and so, you know, on that, and there's also things to, to not eat, right? So when you talk about things to eat, you do your berries, you do your apples, you put in more fruits and vegetables, you put in high fiber foods, you do your best to decrease your sugar, decrease your high caffeine, except green tea. The green tea has a phytonutrient also that helps. Um, it's not the same as coffee. Um, reduce your alcohol intake. Um, and anything, honestly, that makes you feel bloated or gassy, because anytime you overtax your digestive system, you're going to feel bad. And so that's overeating. That's um, eating foods, again, that can bloat you and make you really gassy because your body then has to focus on that. And it takes away from your mood and your energy. Um, mm. Yeah, I don't know. No, I mean, that, that's all helpful. So what do you say? Yeah. What would you say to the, and I know you get this all the time because I do as well, to the person <laughs> who says two things. I don't like vegetables. No. Uh, my kid, I, or I can't get my kids to eat vegetables. Um, that's one. But then the other one is, and, and that's very real. And then the other one is, um, you know, affordability. Like, what if you, if you can't find watercress? Because a lot of stores, some, a lot of stores aren't carrying watercress. Where, what other, what other herbs or vegetables you, would you suggest? See, so, you know, people sleep on the ninety-nine cent store. The yeah. ninety-nine cent store has great vegetables. They've got. Mm -hmm all the leafy greens, they've got all your fruits and berries. You know, you can find things in the 99 cent store and you can find organic things in the 99 cent store if you choose to. So, you know, eating and switching your diet doesn't have to be expensive. Um, and if you are a heavy meat eater, you know, meat's going, meat is gonna go up in price at some point, you know, based in our COVID times and meat packing right. industries closing. So I found that people that were eating heavy meat and then started going to fruits and vegetables were like, wow, if I, just on a basic shift, it's less expensive. Um, but when I when I, people ask me that, I dates honestly. You know, you put dates. I think problem with the kids when it turns up to be green. You know, that green juice or that green shake. Yeah. It's it's the color that they're like, I don't want any more of that. Yeah. But if you can not make it so green, like maybe make it purple, like berries, you know, and do something like that. But even um, if you throw a couple of dates in there, it makes it sweet. And dates are actually high in potassium. So it's yeah. not like, you know, it's a bad thing, even though it's really sweet and really sugary. So it, it, for the kids, it's kind of the color, you know. Yeah. Um, but other than that, yeah. I, I think also, which, which 
you know, fiber, a lot of people don't know fiber helps keep you full, right? So you're yes. not, you're not overeating. Um, yeah. What are some of the fibers out there that, that you would suggest for people to start with? I'd already, I'd suggested a lot of folks, you know, starting with brown rice and people say, I don't like brown rice. Told them about how high it's high, it's high in fiber and that you, you know, you could cook it in a vegetable broth to, to give it more flavor. Flavor. Yeah. What other um, fibers do you like out there? You know, I'm going to go back to my green leafies. I, mm -hmm. I, I'm a fan of those. You know, when you talk about um, spinach is one, if you could do that. Uh, we've got arugula. You've got any salad mix. I mean, you, you're, any of your, your lettuces and your vegetables are going to have a higher fiber content than anything else. Okay. Um, your fruits. But I tell, a lot of people will do is they'll juice. Mm -hmm. And they go, oh, I'm juicing it. So I'm getting my fruit. What you're getting is the sugar. If you're yeah. doing the, the juice, eat the fruit, not just drink the juice. So when you eat that fruit, you automatically get the fiber to it. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's, ex huh? that's extremely helpful. I think, um, like you said, you, you're pulling all that fiber out, all that great stuff for your, for your gut and your body. Yeah. I know we're at, um, we're at 620. So I want to, open it up. I want to thank you, Chef. And then if you had anything else you wanted to share before we got into the question. Yeah. Can I say one thing, which is, you know, there's a lot of, um, when you talk, there's also teas. So I didn't really get a chance to go into a ton of teas, but there are teas that can also help to reduce stress. And you can mm. find these teas, you know, pretty much at your local store. But if you're looking at like a holy basil tea, also known as Tulsi, Skullcap, Hops, you know, chamomile, those are great to just relax you and reduce your stress in the evening. Um, some to help you increase your mood would be like lemon balm and St. John's wort. Um, I do a tea in the evening mixed with elderberry, hops, skullcap, chamomile, and it's just helpful to relax me before I get ready to go to bed. Yeah. Put, you put that phone down and, and drink some tea. Yes. And get it gets some sleep, right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So thank you, thank you so much. Um, so I'm gonna turn it back over to, to, to Dr. Bastian so he can address some of the questions that we have. Um, but I appreciate all I learned so much, and I hope our, our, our guests have as well. Thank you very much, Bryce. And thank you again, uh Miss Ward. Uh this very, very useful information um i too have to to figure out um you know when i'm going to get my my uh, high fiber and look for some saffron and and uh i got notes <laughs> so as we were talking about earlier you know we can't sit around on the screen too much but unfortunately that's a, that's a large part of the day so thank you very much so we're going to move on to the uh the q a from the public so the first one this is for anybody in the panel to jump in um let me just locate it again. All right. The history of trauma in our community, unfortunately, has had the effect of normalization of crisis. Our people's expectations of calamities in life leads to a separation from or escape from reality by various means. So with that, how do we assist children in building the mental fortitude and understanding of how they manage emotions? And I'll open that up to any of, any of the panelists. And let me just uh, read the, the the premise of the question again. Uh, I think that um, okay. I, Got it. Thank yeah. you. For me, it it comes down to modeling, right? Where you can't ask a kid to do something that you're not doing, right? They're looking at you as that example. So if you're maximizing your time, and if you're doing the things that you want to see in your child, then your child will begin to emulate that, right? They children are mimickers, and so they are great at copying what you do. And so if they don't see you being active in terms of being a solutionist and turning over all the stones of things that are available, right? If they're not seeing you reading, if they're not seeing you making that attempt, they will then think that this is how you handle things and this is how you deal with it. And then they collapse. And if you're not communicating, you know, with the kids and treating them as people, and getting an understanding of how they feel and where they are, irrespective of their age, right? Then you'll get that connection. But, you know, uh, coming into fatherhood, being a stepfather, 
understanding the idea that, um, you know, the kids want to do certain things, but we have to find that way to guide them down that path through example, right? And if you treat a kid like a kid and don't respect the fact that, you know, once they're seven or eight or nine, they can actually comprehend stuff, right? And you can talk to them and ration with them and give them logical things. And if you analyze them, then you keep them in that bubble, right? But talking to them and challenging them, you know, with thought and getting them to express themselves, you know, that would help out a lot because it's difficult to figure out what to do if you don't really know what's wrong. Thank you for that. Thank you very much. Can, uh, can I piggyback on that? Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Just um, everything that Lawrence said is spot on. And just from a learning and motivation standpoint, modeling is really critical. Um, but also if they're feeling this crisis and they're understanding it, but not quite, right? Their brains are developing at a different pace. Uh, uh, women's brains, young people's brains aren't really developed. They say girls till around early 20s and, and men, young men and boys till late 20s, right? So think about that. They're trying to really wrestle with all these emotions and feelings. And so absolutely you modeling good coping strategies, but the conversation, like to Lawrence's point, and as I was speaking to earlier, um, one example I wanted to use is for little ones, you can say, where's take your temperature, right? We take our temperature for COVID. Mm -hmm. How can we take our temperature? Are we here? Are we anxious? Are we overwhelmed? Are we here? Are we a little low? Are we, you know, and then unpacking that a little bit um, with our teens or our older ones, being willing to be open and have longer conversations. How do you feel? Why? You feel like we can't do anything. It's hopeless. Well, what are you going to do with that? You know, sometimes we will go down that spiral. Well, I've seen you pick up a bottle of beer when you're a little down, you know, so like, well, we don't want to go to using, we don't want to go to abusing, right? We get, we take our anger or our frustrations or the crises we feel that are embodied and we want to put them out there in the world, really having that conversation, talking about it. So we don't go down those paths that we have, you know, PTSD, post-traumatic slave syndrome, right? Our DNA, it's built in our DNA, mm. right? To cope in certain ways. And so how do we unpack that? So that when we are in crisis and we know what that is, we're able to talk about it and find positive coping strategies. That's awesome. I, we have yeah, about three minutes left. I just want to let everybody know. Can I also add something to that? Um, and when I work with um, children, also when I was doing tutoring, one of the things that I think is also important is to get them to understand, as I think we all need to understand, is that we're not our emotions. And our emotions are actually something that moves through us. And so one of the techniques that I would use with a student is, you know, because if they're all in their head, we could never get to our work, right? So it was to just focus on something outside of them, like a tree. And you sit down and you look at the tree. Well, what color is the tree? What is it? You know, just really identifying that tree down to its finest, finest detail. And by the time that conversation ended, they felt better. And it was just an example to, to, for them to understand that whatever they were feeling at that moment would actually pass. And then that conversation became open to more truly understanding what else is going on. But once you can also you know, allow people to understand that what they're feeling isn't who they are and it's not set in stone and can pass through them, then you have a wider range or wider varieties of being able to teach them other modalities to even stop that emotion from taking over them before they get to that space. Yeah, that's powerful. We, um, so I just wanted to oh, add ahead. one thing about, sorry, it's a little off top, not what Julie's saying, but just back to the modeling. I think modeling also is very important in technology and sleep. Uh, and again, as parents and, and, and even teachers, if you want children to use technology wisely, then we've got to model those behaviors. I agree. So I'm throwing my phone away. <laughs> and and keep it out of keep it outside your bedroom when you sleep. That's yes. the most yes. important. Yes. <laughs> uh, Dr. Bass, do you, you want to close this out and then I'll add some thank yous. Sure. Appreciate everybody. First of all, I want to thank all of our, all of our panelists uh, by name. Thank you, Dr. Cordova and Dr. Larson, uh, uh, Amber Gravely, Lawrence Jackson. Dr. Kaveri Subramaniam, K. Ron Valentine, and Julie Ward. Uh, we really appreciate you guys being here, coming together, and having this powerful 
um, critical dialogue. Um, and, and with critical dialogue, that's how we, we lead ourselves to action and, and more reflection and, and more dialogue. So it's a continuous cycle of, of improvement for our lives. So thank you all. I also would like to, on, the, on behalf of Inglewood Unified, I'd like to um, thank American Heart Association, Inglewood Active Communities, and I'd like to acknowledge our county administrator, Dr. Erica Torres, as well as our research and technology experts, uh, Sandra Naranjo and Shanti Prasad, who work behind the scenes on the Inglewood side to collaborate to make this possible. And uh, last but not least, I'd like to thank Mr. Bryce Llewellyn uh, for initiating this powerful partnership with Inglewood Unified. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And, and in closing, I wanna thank the panelists again. I really appreciate it. I learned so much. Thanks to um, everybody who attended. And also um, this could not happen without a village. And so I'd like to thank our staff, Marissa Fortuno, Tiffany Tung, Christine Kelly, Elena, um, hope I'm not forgetting one else, but it takes a, it takes a village to pull this off. Carol um, Berhana and Nicola Ross as well. I, mean, I really appreciate it. And I hope everybody has a great rest of their evening and, and weekend. All right, bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Later.